Justice and 
Good morning and welcome to a rainy Grange. Uh, we, well, we, Paul, hung out, hung out our washing this morning before we started and it's now getting very wet. But never mind. 
Um, it's going to be sunny later. Sunny later, we hope. Yes. Um, so we have this week from the Manse Kitchen and two more uh, before we are planning to be back in church and streaming from there in a slightly different format. So, um, yes, it's a strange time. Next week in the afternoon, for those who are um, part of the Grange congregation, we have our general church meeting online. You should have had information about that. If you haven't, do get in touch and I'll send some to you. Um, I think that's all for notices. <laughs> um, we're going to start with our first song, uh, which is one of our Toast Church favourites. When I wake up in the morning in my bed, God behind, God beside, God ahead. And we wondered, we've made up an extra verse uh, for this morning, which links with our reading. I'll tell you a bit more about that in, the min in a minute, but we were wondering whether we should actually sing it. Sing, when it's raining on my washing, very hard, but we won't sing that. Um, <laughs> Our first reading later on is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian that he meets on the road and tells about Jesus. And so our third verse of this song um, is related to that reading. I'll leave you to see if you know the story to see if you can find the links and see where the, what it's talking about. Anyway, that's enough waffling. Let's sing. <clears throat> Shine and the rain oh. in the laughter. 
the mind. <laughs> And so let's pray. God, we thank you that you are with us, even when it's raining. You surround us and you fill us. We thank you for the joy as we continue to celebrate this Easter season, that you are alive, not just many years ago, not just in a faraway place, but here and now. In, in Grange, in the South Lake Circuit, in whatever place we are in, you are with us in our homes and in our hearts. We're sorry for the times when we forget this, the times when perhaps we try to do things our own way or think that we have to be responsible for everything, the times when we forget to look to you for our guidance, and our help. Help us to renew our relationship with you in listening for your voice and in following your call, whatever you ask us to do, even if sometimes it seems a little bit strange, and help us to continue to support one another in doing that. In Jesus' name we offer all these prayers. Amen. Amen. So we are still in the Easter season, and I might keep on reminding you of that. Um, through the Easter season, the lectionary that suggests the readings that we use each week from the Bible gives us readings from the book of Acts instead of the Old Testament. The Acts of the Apostles is the story of what Jesus' followers did after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit had filled them with boldness and power. Now, I have to admit, I always really struggle to know what to do with these readings because we haven't got to Pentecost yet. We've just had Easter. Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. And it seems a little bit sort of in the wrong order to me to have Easter and then immediately to be starting to think about what happened after Pentecost. We will be celebrating Pentecost in a few weeks. Um, so quite often I don't use those readings from Acts, but... We are going to use today's. It's a story that I love. The story of Philip and the Ethiopian, as I said. In some ways, it's told as if the extraordinary things that are going on are completely unremarkable. It doesn't sensationalise it. It just tells us this story. And yet it's a really surprising and dramatic encounter it's part of the picture of God breaking free of the limits and the categories that people try to place on God. I wonder if, as we hear it, can you hear the joy and the excitement in all that happens? And thank you to Mick, isn't it? Mick's reading this uh, for us. Thank you. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Edited, Philip and the Ethiopian. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and go south, he said. Go to the desert road that runs down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. Lo and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who was in charge of her whole treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was on his way back home. He was sitting in his chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. Go up and join his chariot, said the spirit to Philip. So Philip ran up and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading, he asked. How can I, he replied, unless someone gives me some help. So he invited Philip to get up and sit beside him. The biblical passage he was reading was this one. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, judgment was taken away from him. Who can explain his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. 
Tell me, said the eunuch to Philip, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip took a deep breath and, starting from this biblical passage, told him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. Look, said the eunuch, here is some water. What's to stop me being baptised? So he gave orders for the chariot to stop. And both of them went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch together, and he baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him any more. But he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, turned up at Azotus. He went through all the towns announcing the good news until he came to Caesarea. Thank you, Mick. Um, so our gospel reading that we're going to have now is one of the seven I am statements that John that um, John tells us about in John's gospel. Jesus says there are seven things I am. And uh, yeah, so uh, we heard one of them last week. I am the good shepherd. This week's reading is the very last I am. It's part of what Jesus taught on the night that he was arrested, presumably um, it's the one that he wanted to leave his friends with as he was taken from them and as they were separated. It speaks about being joined to him. And uh, Jean's reading this for us. Thank you, Jean. The reading is taken from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. And it's heading the true vine. I am the true vine, said Jesus, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it can bear more fruit. You are already clean. That's because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. The branch can't bear fruit by itself, but only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you can't bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. People who remain in me, and I in them, are the ones who bear plenty of fruit. Without me, you see, you can't do anything. If people don't remain in me, they are thrown out like a branch and they wither. People collect the branches and put them on the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask for whatever you want, and it will happen to you. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear plenty of fruit, and so become my disciples. Amen. Oops. Oh. That shouldn't have happened. What happened? Lord's Prayer came up Sorry, we weren't singing the Lord's Prayer there, but we are going to uh, sing our next hymn, which is uh, in the Singing the Faith, if you're following in there, it's number 678, but to the tune of 142, and it's Come All Who Look to Christ Today.
Our readings today are such rich passages. There's so much we could spend time thinking about and exploring and delving into. It's hard to know where to start in many ways. Um, on previous, in previous years, when uh, we've had uh, these passages, or when we've been looking at the passage about the vine and the branches, the manse apple trees have made an appearance. Uh, they've been very much on my mind this year. Um, yeah, you can put the picture up. So uh, here is a picture of one of the apple trees in the manse garden. Earlier in the year, they desperately needed pruning and I could see them, I, I now have, because we've been spending so much time working from home and I've had so many Zoom meetings, I've got myself sorted out with a standing desk so I'm not sitting down every hour of the day. And when I stand at my desk, I can see straight out uh, past my computer and see the apple trees in the garden. And so I've been looking at them for weeks and months uh, and their desperate need for pruning because they were so congested and they had loads of um, shoots going straight up in the air, which you're supposed to take off um, in the winter. Uh, in the past, these apple trees, I think, have not been particularly well cared for because even some of the major branches are very congested. And um, so following the advice of a book on how to prune and care for old apple trees, I've been doing some major restructuring of them. Well, I say I, we. Mostly <laughs> He's been holding the ladder. Um, <laughs> um, uh, a few years ago, and um, probably about five years ago now, um, I, we took back some really major branches. Actually, it was my mum helping me that time. Um, we took back some really major branches right back. Um, and I've been meaning to do some more of that as they'd started to recover and, and grow back from those sort of stumps, really. And so it's best to do that in winter. But this year, with the busyness of everything, it got later and later and I hadn't had a chance. And I was still looking at these um, congested branches. And as we uh, come up to Easter, I was watching the, the buds on them develop. You know, you're supposed to prune them before the leaves come out uh, while the tree's dormant. Finally, we pruned them just after Easter in the Easter holidays and I thought it might be too late and I thought the trees might not be very imp impressed and it might harm them. Well, I don't know whether this is a response to them not being very impressed at being pruned, but they have burst into life. They are covered in blossom. I really didn't expect it because apple trees um, tend to have a good year and then a poor year in terms of their fruiting and they had a very good year last year. So um, here they are, covered in blossom. It looks like we might have another really good crop of apples this year. Like the vine that Jesus spoke of, pruning really does help increase, increase fruitfulness. And that leads me on to thinking, I wonder how that might be true for us as individuals and for us as churches in the pruning that we've experienced over the past year, difficult and uncomfortable though it has been. I will leave you to think about that for yourselves because we have thought quite a lot in services about what good might grow from the pandemic experience and you probably don't want to hear me go on about it again. Today I want us to spend some time with Philip and the Ethiopian and think about what that story has to say to us. Um, if we wanted a quick simple lesson from that story, uh, perhaps it is that we ought to be prepared like Philip to go where the spirit leads, even when it seems maybe a bit ridiculous to go out to a wilderness place um, and, even, and to speak boldly as the Holy Spirit prompts us. Now, that's probably true, but as I've said before in our services, I'm not sure it's that helpful to just be told that it's our duty to tell people about Jesus and so we should get on with it. I think it's much better to be excited about Jesus and then maybe we won't just be able to help ourselves. We will be bearing fruit like these trees without being able to hold it back. So what exciting things do we learn about Jesus and about the kingdom of God in this story of Philip and the Ethiopian? Well, I think to start with, we need to understand a bit about this Ethiopian man. He is not your average New Testament character. 
for a start, he is a very long way from home. And uh, that's why we've stuck on this picture because we've got another picture to show you now. Here is a map. Um, the journey from, well, just for the sake of argument, Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to Jerusalem. I had to look on Google Maps. Here it is. That journey, oh, it's even made somebody move so, in, so they can come and have a look at the picture on screen. Um, the, uh, that journey uh, would, would today would be over 2,600 miles by road through some very harsh country, which you can see from the satellite pictures, you know, just how hard that land would be to travel through. It's um, up through Sudan and up to Cairo in Egypt and then uh, kind of northeast um, overall through, through Israel to Jerusalem. I don't know if that's the route that the Ethiopian would have taken, but if you look at the other possibilities, I'm not sure that they're that much better. And we were hearing about him being on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Well, Gaza is on the north coast, um, a little north of where of, of that route. Um, but he was presumably travelling towards Cairo uh, to make his way home, we guess. Now, if we were to try and make sense of how far that is, from Grange, if we were to travel 2,600 miles from Grange, we would get, in one direction, well beyond Moscow. Or, if we take a slightly different, uh, different direction, we'd get well beyond Istanbul, to the centre of Turkey. Or if we went south, we'd get well beyond Morocco. It's a very long way from home. And this uh, Ethiopian man has come to Jerusalem to worship God. So you can take the picture down now. There we go. <laughs> Try not to say next slide, please, or anything like that. Um, so it was quite a pilgrimage that he had gone on. Sometimes it's assumed that because he's from Ethiopia and therefore he's a foreigner in Israel, that he wasn't a Jew. Although actually, um, when you read the commentaries and things, there is some debate about that. But it's quite likely that he was a Jew. There was a Jewish community in Egypt before the time of Jesus. And actually, some of that ancient Jewish community are still there, although um, many died out in a, um, a time of famine, um, oh, way back before the 80s when we were thinking about the famine in Ethiopia. There were famines before. Um, but there are some of that ancient Jewish community still there, and apparently their style of worship uh, was very much more, or is very much more, based on the Judaism of the first temple, so well bef before Jesus' time. Also, in the next few chapters of Acts, uh, we hear about Cornelius coming to uh, believe in Jesus, and he is described as the first Gentile to follow Jesus, which would suggest that actually this Ethiopian was a Jew. The next thing we're told about him is that he's a eunuch. Now, I suppose I should apologise if there are any children watching and if it prompts any difficult questions. Um, but it is part of our understanding of this man and who he was. He had probably been castrated as a boy. To the Jews in Israel, this was probably about as repulsive as it is to us. It was forbidden in Judaism. Um, the Jewish law in Deuteronomy says that the eunuchs were forbidden from joining the assembly, from, from going into the temple. Um, and that really kind of comes back to the point that one of the primary responsibilities of a Jewish man was to be, uh, to, to be able to father children, to be fruitful, to continue the family line. Um, that's the command of God. And this Ethiopian is irreversibly incapable of doing that. And yet in his home context, he's a high-ranking official in the Queen's court. He's an important person. Now, I understand that it was sometimes the case in some uh, societies 
that the minor royals, the, those who are more distant members of the royal family, would be castrated and put into the Queen's service because it meant that they were then no threat to the royal line because they couldn't establish their own line. So here's this Ethiopian returning from Jerusalem. And as a eunuch, we might ask, has he even been able to worship God in the way that he wanted? Has he been able to go into the temple and offer sacrifice? Was that what he wanted to do? He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah. We might assume that perhaps that's a, a souvenir he picked up from the temple bookshop. I'm not sure it's quite like that. But he has come to Jerusalem and got a copy of those scriptures and he's reading them on his journey home. Now that in itself identifies him as a wealthy man. Um, scrolls were very expensive things and they would not have been owned by most people. For most people, the scrolls would have been owned as a community in the, in the synagogue or, uh, or you know something similar. Um, but here he is, he's in his carriage on his own, uh, reading from his scroll. And the fact that he's, a re he's reading shows that he's educated because really being able to read was not a given for anyone. So he's quite a strange figure. He doesn't easily fit into the categories that people might look to understand somebody. We might say he's liminal. Liminal is a word that means kind of between places, on the boundaries. He's male, but then on the other hand, he's not really male in the sense that people would expect or understand. He doesn't entirely fit that category of maleness. He would have been of low status among the Jews and scorned in Roman society as well, which was all about fertility and virility. So because of his impotence, those, both those cultures would have seen him as, as um, low status and disregarded. But he was at the same time high ranking in the Queen's court in his own country. He's educated. But as he says to Philip, he doesn't understand what it is that he's reading, though he's keen to learn. And as far as the Jews and the Romans were concerned, actually from Ethiopia, he's actually from the very edge of civilization. He's from the ends of the earth. You really couldn't get any far, further away in their minds than somewhere like Ethiopia. The ends of the earth. I wonder if that phrase sounds familiar. Before Jesus left his friends, he told them that the Holy Spirit would fill them with power to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' followers started out sharing the good news in Jerusalem where they were. And then persecution scattered them. And if we read from the beginning of Acts through the chapters that lead up to here, um, we would read all about what's going on. And chapter eight starts with that persecution scattering the uh, followers of Jesus and them having therefore to go through all the provinces of Judea and Samaria. And here we are at the end of chapter eight. Uh, Philip meets this man, traveling back to the end of the earth. This man who then is able to take his newfound faith with him. This is it, this is what Jesus had promised at the beginning of Acts when he said um, his, his followers would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The kingdom of God has horizons that are continuing to expand. Because this good news of God's kingdom was never supposed to stay in one place. And it wasn't just for the right sort of person. Jesus showed us this all through his life when he um, spent time with the, the sinners and, uh, you know, the people he wasn't supposed to be with. Um, the kingdom of God was for them. And what this Ethiopian tells us yet again is that God's love reaches everyone even those who don't fit our categories. Whether those are categories of status or wealth or geography or skin colour 
or even binary gender. All belong in God's family, all are invited, all are welcome. And this Ethiopian knew instinctively. He said to Philip uh, in their conversation when they'd been talking about who Jesus was, the Ethiopian said, well, what is to keep me from being baptised? Nothing, nothing. Perhaps he and Philip had together read a little further on in the scroll. Isaiah, a few chapters later, writes, don't let the eunuchs say, I am a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says, I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house, you know, not outside the temple because they're not allowed in, I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. What a wonderful promise for that man to find, to read and find himself there in the scriptures. And I wonder if he'd heard Jesus' words about the vine and the branches, how he would have felt as he asked to be baptised. And I'm just going to read a little bit of that for us to think back about how it connects with this story. It says, you are already clean. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Even if you're someone people consider to be fruitless, you will bear much fruit. Ask for anything you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And then Jesus goes on to say, a little bit after what we heard, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And that's what we're told. This Ethiopian man is indeed filled with joy as he heads for home. So what about us? Does all of this fill us with joy? Are we excited? Perhaps for many of us, we... Really, realistically, we're on the inside now. We're, we're at the, you know, we're part of the church, perhaps. Um, although in Jesus' time, for most of us, we would have been from the ends of the earth too, you know, way up in this uh, cold and drafty island with its rain, although the sun's come out now. Um, you know, we too would have been from the ends of the known world. And... You know, God's horizons, the horizons of God's love and God's kingdom are broad enough even to include us. And isn't that wonderful? And isn't it even more exciting to know that those who are on the edges today, those who are, you know, between categories, those who don't really fit in, are also included and welcome. They are also part of God's kingdom, whoever they are, whoever you are. You are welcome. And what a joy and a privilege it is to be able to share that wonderful good news. It makes me excited. I hope you feel some excitement about it too. So we're going to sing um, a hymn that I love. It's number 409 in the book, Let Us Build a House Where Love Can Dwell.
And so we bring our prayers and there's a response, our Eastertide uh, intercessions response. When I say Lord of life, I invite you to say, hear us in your love. Lord of life, hear, hear us in, in your love. love. And so loving God, knowing your love and the breadth of your horizons, knowing that you are interested and care about all that happens, all that you see. We bring our prayers today. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those who seek to use their office for the good of others. And we pray for those who have made mistakes. We pray for those who do not understand the lives of the people they govern or the power they have over them. And we pray for those who are fearful of the power that they hold. You have shown us by your resurrection life that you are Lord of all. Lord of life, hear, hear us in, in your love. love. We pray for the desperate situation in India and in Brazil and other countries so devastated by the impact of COVID. For those who are sick and dying, 
for those who are worried and grieving. And for all who are working with so few resources to care for them. These places might seem like the ends of the earth to us. Help us to recognise the humanity of each of those people no less than ours. You have shown us that life, your life, overpowers death and we long to see it in action today. Lord of life, hear, hear us in your, your love. We pray for our schools, for students and for teachers, especially those who are at this time working their way through different ways of assessing and testing. We pray for those sitting exams earlier than normal and for those who bear the responsibility for giving grades when this is not what they normally do. And we pray for those for whom academic study really is a struggle at the best of times, when these are not the best of times. We pray for those whose home life is difficult and for those who just don't feel they fit in. You have shown us that your love is truly for all. Lord of life, hear, hear us in, in your, your love. love. And we pray for those who are experiencing any kind of suffering or exclusion. Those who are in physical pain or mental anguish or grieving. Those who have been unjustly treated because of their colour or nationality, their gender or sexuality, their mental or physical ability, their economic circumstances or their appearance. We pray for those struggling to come to terms with their own identity in any way. In the quietness we hold before you anyone known to us who is on our minds and in our hearts. You promise to hear all who call out and seek you. Lord of life, hear, hear us in your love. And we pray for your church throughout the world in the beauty of its diversity reaching all the ends of the earth. We thank you for Roman Catholic and Protestant, Episcopal and Congregational, Orthodox and Coptic, for our many ways of praying and worshipping and serving you and the richness we discover as we learn from one another. In one another, help us to truly find that you are not bound to any particular people or place or time, but present with and in each one of us. And may that learning spur us on to broaden our own horizons and welcome others. Lord of life, hear, hear us in, in your love. love. And we gather all of these prayers and those that we have not spoken as we share together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
our final hymn today is a hymn again that reminds us that it is still Eastertide. It's number 297, Christ is alive, let Christians sing. It reminds us that Christ is not bound to a particular time or place, but reaches all of us here and now. So may we all go into this coming week knowing that Christ is alive, that Christ speaks and Christ welcomes all. May we be witnesses to that good news. Let's share the grace together. May, may the, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Next week, uh, well actually this coming week is uh, Christian Aid Week, I think that's right, isn't no, it? Tenth, no, is it the 10th yeah. it starts? Yes. Okay, well next week I think we might be thinking about Christian Aid, but we'll work that out when we get there. <laughs> Have a good week. <laughs>